Good morning. It is a delight to be here with you today um, to talk about some of my research. So, I love hearing about long histories of geeky culture because I grew up as a geek online in the early days when it was just those of us who were self-identified geeks, freaks, and queers who were online. And I was all three, so it was a really comfortable place for me. And like many other geeks who grew up in that period, I spent my childhood sort of frustrated by a variety of different things. Right? I decided I wasn't really fond of the sort of normal behaviors that were sort of around me. I really couldn't stand being treated in particular ways and told how to behave, particularly because of my gender. I saw inefficiencies in the society around me, frustration at the bureaucracy, frustration at the way our democracy was handled. And like many other geeks, that just meant we saw an opportunity for technology to fix it, a way that we would jump in and we would do something about that. Now, growing up in the United States, which we were, I was very much growing up in Reagan's America, this also meant that it was tinged with a capitalist ideal, which is that we had to build technologies and build them within a corporate structure. We were naive. Um, the de facto motto, as many of you have unfortunately gotten to witness, for Silicon Valley and the US tech sector is to move fast and break things. Now, this was a proud mantra for many of us because we wanted to break the things that we saw as broken. Never in our wildest dreams did we imagine that we were going to be breaking the social structures that really mattered. We didn't imagine that we could break democracy. We didn't ma imagine that we could break social cohesion. And yet here we are. We're in an uncomfortable place around that. So breaking social infrastructures is actually a lot easier than fixing them. And governance is particularly hard. So I want to talk about where, what this means given our data-driven environments, right? Because in the colloquial sense, artificial intelligence often means doing magic with data. Um, unfortunately, people who have never worked with data uh, seem to think that data can speak for themselves um, and that technologies uh, can make people smarter and do more ethical decision making than humans. And of course, now we're starting to laugh at this. And we recognize that this is naive and this is as naive as the idea that breaking systems would be a good thing. Data has become a tool of power and we're starting to recognize that. And to use it and to be a part of that, we have to recognize the political and cultural agendas that are at play. So I often think about this quote from Jeff Bowker from over a decade ago, which is that raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. To the contrary, data should be cooked with care. And the question, of course, is what is that data and what does it look like? So on my first day of an introduction to data, a data science course in the US, I asked the students uh, to load a, computer or, or, sorry, a, a data file under their computers. And this particular file came from the New York City Police Department. And this was a course in New York, and it contained the records of everybody who'd been stopped, frisked, and arrested um, in New York over a year. Now, getting that data was a whole political process of trying to make the New York City Police Department accountable. And so people in this class had heard about this data set. And I wanted to sh them to show that they could actually use their new environment, they could use Python to load a file. So I asked them to do so and to, and to tell me what the average age of somebody who had been arrested was. One by one, the students sort of proudly announced that the age was 27. And I saw them go around the classroom, and I was like, great, everybody got the same answer, right? And everybody nods their heads proudly. It's the first day of class. And then I asked them, is that data accurate? And they look at me with these blank stares, like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, can you explain that number? And they start pulling on these different logics. One explains, I thought it would have been younger, but I guess there are a lot of homeless people in New York, so maybe that's why it's older. And they start to introduce all of their social biases, all of their prejudices, in explaining this number that they had all come to. And again, I return, is the number accurate? And again, blank stares. I said, please run a distribution on that data. And they do a distribution, and their eyes widen. Why are so many people 99 in the data? I'm like, why are so many people 99 in the data? More importantly, you have two variables. You have an age variable and a date of birth variable. And guess what? They don't match. What's going on here? And you start to realize that the data are biased in all of these different ways. Now, most data are noisy, uh, filled with error. But too few people actually take a moment to stop and really think about the data. Where did they come from? What do they look like? How does it actually make sense in the environment around us? And that's really important because we're building out these systems um, that are the tools for our architectures, and they're data-driven. But we don't even know much about the kinds of data that we're dealing with. 
And yet that data is what introduced all sorts of flaws into the system. It's the first thing that breaks a data-driven system. So I think about this often when I think about the work of Latanya Sweeney. Latanya is a computer scientist um, who is really fascinated by how um, algorithmic systems work. And one day, she threw her own name into Google trying to find a paper she had written. And she was surprised by the advertisements that pop up. And they were basically saying, Latanya arrested? And she was like, excuse me, what is this? Knowing that she had no full record, she had no reason to be associated with an arrest, she was wondering what was going on here. So she got an idea, and she pulled out a data set of US birth names associated most commonly by race. Uh, so really common white baby names and really common black baby names, and she threw it against Google to see what ads would come out. And sure enough, there was a whole set of different ads that were asking for whether or not you wanted to find somebody's background check or somebody's criminal arrest record. It was the same company. But sure enough, when she put in names of black baby names, they came out with the criminal arrest records. And when she put in names that were associated with white names, they came out with a background check. She was like, that's fascinating. Now, Latonia actually knows a lot about how the Google system is architected, so just she went sort of further and kept toying with the system, and what she realized was that it wasn't that you were buying baby names on whether that baby name is associated with a black name or a white name. It was that this comp company that was selling background checks had six different kinds of ads, and they threw all those ads at all names um, in the system. And then depending on what people clicked on, that would train the system about future names that should pop back out with which particular kind of ad. So in other words, what happened was that the company purchased across baby names, the public starts searching for baby names and is more likely to click on the criminal justice products when they're searching for black names than we're searching for white names. The public taught Google how to be racist and, raci and, and Google then amplified that racism right back at all the rest of us. And that's a pretty interesting moment because what you see is the intersection between the data that is about baby names and the data that is produced by the interactions with the public. Now, Google didn't design their system to be biased, but some systems uh, are ludicrously biased for all sorts of long-standing reasons. So, I'm living in the United States, I'm going to give you some US contextual examples, and our judicial system is an atrocity. It's rooted in our long-standing history of slavery, and it has a huge and deeply wedded um, history of racism built, built into it, right? In the United States, we uh, incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the world. So what happened is that when slavery morphed into Jim Crow laws, it then morphed again into our incarceration process, and we actually do a lot of things to incarcerate people for long periods of time, um, with a majority of them being black and brown people. So well-meaning people, um, uh, mostly academics, want to really address the problem of mass incarceration in the United States. Many of these people who are incarcerated are there for low-risk uh, criminal activities, mostly in the forms of the drug uh, war that we've uh, persecuted in the United States. And so the idea was that why don't we start looking at the data and figure out who's going to be low-risk and do work to help uh, get those people out. The difficulty there is that they're basing those models on the population that there is data for. And who do we have data for? People who have been arrested, people who have been incarcerated, people who have um, left the carceral system. And so what you end up with is the data itself is so biased and the logics are so biased that we build those biased systems even as we're trying to de-bias them. And more importantly, because we then reintroduce them into judicial decision making, which is that the data models are not the ones that are actually making the decision, you give it back to a judge, you're then layering on another form of bias um, in the United States, which has to do with our judicial processes. And so we end up with a situation where even though whites are far more likely to consume and sell drugs in the United States, blacks are extraordinarily more likely to be arrested um, and prosecuted, and those things cycle through even in an attempt to unbias the data. So, one of the things that we often talk about, just like with the judge, is the idea that if we introduce a human into the loop, we can find a way to de-bias a lot of these different systems. If we introduce a human decision maker in there, we don't have to worry as much about where the bias is in the data. 
right? And this has often been the logic of the risk assessment scores, which is that produce the number, just give them to the judge, but let judge make a decision. Well, here's the funny thing about a judge making that decision. Even a well-meaning judge is not likely to override the, the information given by a risk assessment score. And the reason is very simple. If they override it and let somebody out and then that, some, that person ends up engaging in a criminal activity, they're going to get blamed. Right? And that nervousness, especially since in the United States a huge number of judges are actually elected, um, that nervousness means people are actually guided and shift towards whatever the data recommends that they do. But humans in the loop can also um, create all sorts of other interesting challenge. My colleague, uh, Madeline Ellis, was researching the history of the autopilot in aviation, and she came across some very interesting debates about whether or not autopilot should be allowed. Now, this is the 70s, and one of the things that had really become clear in the 1970s was that planes flown by autopilot are actually much safer than planes flown by humans. And so this was a really good explanation for why autopilot should be introduced as a really powerful thing. Um, but of course, people were still nervous. Was it mean to not have a human in the cockpit? And slowly through the different kinds of negotiation, the idea was that you got rid of the navigator but left a pilot and co-pilot in the plane. But the thing is, is this was again understood as human the loop, that that human could jump in when the system failed and could find a way to make certain it worked. Well, here's the thing. Most humans now in 2019 who are sitting in that cockpit haven't actually flown a plane in a very long time, right? They sit there and babysit a machine. And in babysitting that machine, they are supposed to jump in when the machine fails and everything is a mess. This is literally the worst time for a human to take over. Right? And guess what? Humans are terrible at it. But the sor sad thing about this is that most of those planes crash. And so we hear it and say, ah, oh, well, it was just human failure. And you're like, no, the machine went wrong a long time ago. What Madeline argues is that what we've done to the humans um, in those cockpits is that we've de-skilled them on the job. We've made it so that they are actually there with limited ability to take over, and we've turned them into what she calls the liability sponge. They soak up the liability for a corporation, and they take responsibility because they're the last person or last thing to touch the, the system. She argues that this is a way of building a moral crumple zone. Right? If you think of a crumple zone as that part of a car that receives impact, right, this is what happens with morality in these tech, socio-technical systems. It absorbs, the humans in the loop are the ones that absorb the moral crumple zone. Now, when Boeing hit the news, we were sort of fascinated by what this would mean, because for those who haven't followed the Boeing nightmare, um, the reality is, is that this uh, you know, automated system was failing and humans were supposed to jump in and take over, but the system actually rejected the human's ability to take over, right? And humans fought with the system. Um, and of course, at first, one of the most notable things was that the first crash was just blamed as like, it's still pilot error. Pilots are, you know, they just don't know what they're doing. This has nothing to do with the machine. And it wasn't until the second crash where people were even willing to talk about the fact that it was probably the machine. Um, and sure enough, it is the autonomous system that is the problem at play, and, and there's a lot of um, challenges about fixing it. And so one of the things I keep returning to and thinking about this is organizational sociology. So organizational sociology teaches us a lot about how accidents can, can occur and how they can get normalized. Um, and that one of the things you see about normalization of accidents is that it occurs not because of bad people or because of greedy people, but because of systems. And in particular, I keep thinking about the work, um, uh, about Diane Vaughn's work on the Challenger launch decision. And part of it is my age. Um, like many other kids growing up in the US, I still remember the day in which I saw that image. And that image is the Challenger um, uh, space shuttle blowing up. And what happened and unfolded following days was uh, people saying, well, how did it happen? It was too cold in Florida at the time. There were these O-rings. And this presidential report came in to try to analyze the problem. And it reported back this, both this technical failure about the O-rings, but also a systems failure in the form of uh, greedy people at NASA doing the wrong thing, trying to move too fast. All of these things, and they were breaking the system. 
But Diane Vaughn went back into this and said, I'm going to look at this a little bit differently. And she did some really deep ethnographic work. Her original project was to understand greed and deviance. But what she started to realize is that NASA, um, as a government agency, had built out so many processes to try to check for any possible vulnerability that they actually normalized deviance. Now, what does this mean? This means that the O-rings had actually failed in every flight since 1981. So for five years, the O-rings had failed. But they hadn't failed so badly. It wasn't too bad. So the, the, uh, the space shuttle flew again and flew again and flew again until the deviance reached a point in which it could no longer tolerate uh, the pain. And this is also what was challenging about the decision-making processes. The engineers and the scientists disagreed on every call, on every decision-making. So the fact that they disagreed the night before the Challenger launch to, about whether or not to launch it was not an anomaly. It was normal. So what does that mean when we start to normalize things that are deviant? Now, I have a hard time believing that there was any engineer at Boeing or NASA who woke up one day and said, let's make certain that those uh, things crash, right? That's not how it works. I also, I've never met an engineer at Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube who's just like, let's kill democracy. Right? That's not how this works. So what is it about the systems and the processes that get us to the place that we're at? Part of it is, is that we start by designing for the best case scenario, right? Product designers are socialized into the idea of like, let's imagine the cool thing. What if we could just do this amazing thing? Wouldn't that be great? And then in order to make it into a business process, you start building a set of KPIs, um, uh, key performance indicators, which are the metrics that you say, ah, my, this is the meta order metric for success, and here's my portion. So I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to do this thing, and the people over there are going to do this thing, and it's going to build up and do the amazing thing that we articulated, right? And all is going to be great. But where in that process is there a moment to say, ha, there's somebody who's going to do something really bad with that system who's not going to think like you do, right? At best, we get quality assurance at the end. But I, one of the things I think about is that, I, you know, one of my first jobs as an engineer is I had a quality assurance um, engineer by my side the entire way. So I would build something and she would destroy it and I would build it and she would destroy it. And it was a fabulous relationship. But one of the things about social media is we destroyed that. There is no culture of QA anymore. And so the result is, is that you have this moment where a lot of these tech folks are saying, we're going to build community, or we're going to you know, enhance well-being, we're going to build a healthy internet, all of this language. And there's a moment from a distance where you're like, yeah, right, you don't even believe that. But actually, the sad part is they really do believe it. They really think that it's possible. And worse, they think it's possible and able to be profitable. Right? And I would argue those things aren't really possible. So those who are building systems are not trying to make them vulnerable, but building a truly secure system is really difficult, if not impossible. Now, this is because no code is written without bugs. Um, and more importantly, there are now supply chains into these systems, right? You grab a little code here from GitHub, you throw it into your system, you hope the hardware works as it's documented, and look, magic, right? Um, and that is a really fantastic moment of trying to think about where are the problems across the whole stream. Now, normally when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about the unpermitted access to an internal system, or we talk about the collapse of the system entirely. And those are normally the languages we talk about when we're talking about security vulnerabilities. But I would argue that we have to introduce a new framework for thinking about security challenges. Biased data, like I was talking about with Latadia Sweeney, but also the expectations that humans in the loop can actually be a secure process, or the idea that the system can be built based purely on an ideal, those are all introducing different kinds of vulnerability in the systems that we need to start looking at. So I want to talk through some of what are those vulnerabilities and how they get exploited. And I'm going to begin with some work that Michael Golbieski at Bing and I have been working on for the past two years, because we've been fascinated about these moments of structural vulnerabilities. And we talk about this in terms of a concept called data voids. So data voids are what happens when there's a search query, when you search on Google or Bing, and you uh, search in an environment where there aren't any high quality results to offer. 
right? And that's a really tricky thing because there's a lot of content being produced, but sometimes what's returned isn't really great. Or it, and a lot of times when it's not really great, it's because there's nothing good there to begin with. So I'm going to talk about the different kinds of data voids that we've been talking about, um, although you can read this in more detail uh, elsewhere. I'm going to use some US-centric examples, just because that's been so much of the case studies we've been tracking, although we've started to look at them in other languages. And I will say that um, many languages outside of English are far worse in this environment. I would put Swedish somewhere in the middle of this. So when a breaking news story is breaking, um, that what happens is the search engine has limited to no relevant data. Right? And so they get pummeled with search questions for something where there's nothing really to return. So on November 5th of 2017, um, in the US, we all got notifications saying that there was an active shooting happening in Sutherland Springs, Texas. Again, one of the horrible things in the United States is the um, frequency with which we have active shootings. And the reality is, is that you had no information other than the name of that city. So people turned and threw information in, um, into the internet, trying desperately to figure out what was going on. But the thing about Sutherland Springs, Texas, is that it had a population of about 100, and literally no content that was produced by it for it. Um, what you got were automated pages, Zillow pages, census pages, things that were automated for every city um, and zip code in the US. So given this limited amount of content, it's not surprising that people were trying to fill that void. And what happened was a mix of journalists trying to figure out what the heck was going on, but nobody was really based in Sutherland Springs, at the same time um, that other people were saying, this is a moment to pervert the conversation. And what happens is that Google, in these moments, and same with Bing, relies very heavily on Reddit data and on Twitter data in order to fill these voids. So a group of media manipulators coordinated, and we watched them coordinate, coordinated to start throwing things to Reddit and Twitter, trying to fill this void. They wanted to associate the shooter with um, uh, leftist ideologies um, in the US. Um, and this was a group of people who, at the time, were identifying with a phenomenon called alt-right, which was rooted within a white national frame. And so they wanted to associate uh, the shooter, whose name we didn't know and information we had nothing about, with Antifa, a left, what they identified as a leftist group. Now, interestingly, they were not just trying to do this on Twitter and Reddit directly. They were also trying to target journalists by asking journalists and sending journalists information, pretending to be tip lines. And they were doing this through sock puppet accounts, fake accounts that looked like just average Americans sitting in Texas. And um, interestingly, one of the first news stories out the gate was written by Newsweek, um, and the reporter quickly figured out what game was going on, and his story was entirely about how this group of people were coordinating, trying to mess with the, um, uh, the information that would come up. Unfortunately, his editor gave the story this title, Antifa Responsible for Sutherland Springs Murders, According to Far-Right Media. Now, if you know anything about how Google works in its news uh, uh, system, it cuts off after a certain number of characters. What this meant was that for the first 48 hours, any search associated with this shooting gave you the first response of Antifa Responsible for Sutherland Springs Murders. Right? And so, of course, uh, the media manipulators celebrated. Right? They got what they wanted. This was a way of spreading disinformation. Now, another kind of um, uh, data void that we see has to come with strategic terms. In the United States, there, are, there was a political operative in the 1990s uh, known as Frank Luntz, and he became uh, really famous for pithy talking points and coining phrases that would um, help shape ideological uh, you know, uh, commitments within the US. Some of, the, some of his terms might not be familiar to you, things like partial birth abortion or death tax, but one of them will be familiar to you, which is that he coined climate change because global warming sounded too scary. Right, so you can thank him from the phrase climate change, and it was done in order to move a particular political agenda in the US. So when congressional members started amplifying his terms, what could happen is that the news would cover them and they would get these mass amplifications. And it was a very effective way of creating new concepts in public discourse. Well, what happened um, in this environment is that people started creating their own terms, trying them out in online fora, and then trying to push them. But what was more phenomenal in the data voids context is that they built a ton of content all around the internet so that when the term finally popped, people would have that content to go to, and that would be extremist content. So let me give you a concrete example. 
Um, after the Sandy Hook shootings um, in uh, Connecticut, uh, a group of conspiracy theorists started posing the idea that the people who were crying on TV saying that their children, five-year-old children, had been killed uh, weren't actually parents, but they were crisis actors. They were just there pretending to be parents because they were part of the deep state's goal of um, uh, you know, trying to get rid of our guns. And this didn't actually go very far after Sandy Hook. But unfortunately, it kept coming with ev each and every shooting. And after the Parkland shootings in Florida, which was a high school shooting, what we saw was that this term got pummeled at journalists, at the different teenagers who were speaking up on Twitter. So much so that live on CNN, Anderson Cooper asks David Hogg, one of the survivors at Parkland, if he is a crisis actor. And what we saw was a flood of searches. Right, people suddenly paying attention to this term. But what they got in terms of content was really horrible. What they got was conspiratorial content on YouTube, on Google, on Bing, everywhere. Content that had been staged for years um, in the hopes that someday people would be interested in this term. This kind of dynamic is happening with each and every terrible situation. So much so that I, you know, for any journalist in the room, if a new term is given to you, stop, right? Take a pause and search it before you ever play with that. Because we're seeing that kind of effort happen over and over again. We're also seeing it be a moment to um, edit into Wikipedia uh, as a way of addressing this. So if you edit into Wikipedia, you can actually see the terms and see the search engine optimization. All right, the third type of data void um, comes from what happened when there were co uh, once common terms that are no longer regularly used in everyday language. So I'm gonna consider a term in the United States um, uh, such as Negro, um, and this actually plays out differently depending on different languages. Obviously in Spanish, this looks very different. But this word um, in English, uh, when you search on Bing or Google, you get the idea that it has this history that starts uh, recognizing this term as both a positive and negative, depending on who's using it and how it's being used. But unfortunately, YouTube, which has far less data to work with, does not have this as their, as their result. Instead, what happens is that this term um, uh, sort of introduces you to these you know, videos that are historical in nature that look like they should be fine, only they're not fine. What happens when you dive into one of those videos um, is that you get all of these negative terms, all of these comments that are deeply disturbing, and usually um, uh, invitations to different kinds of environments. Um, the other thing that happens is that there are well-known um, political shops that work to really pervert these. So in the United States, there's an organization called PragerU, um, which is uh, a conservative outlet that is determined to undo the leftist agenda of universities. Um, and what it does is take on terms that are no longer regularly produced in terms of content and make certain to capture those and then to challenge them. So if you're a high school student and you've just been introduced to a notion like what is uh, social social justice or what is intersectionality, you're trying to figure this out, you throw it into YouTube and YouTube is the primary search engine for under 25s, what you'll get is these videos that are actually designed to uh, push you towards a very specific agenda that suggests that these concepts are not, th are not part of a broader um, social set of issues of the contemporary day, but they're something that is meant to oppress you in different ways. Now another kind of data void has to come with fragmented concepts because here's the funny thing about search engines. Depending on what you search for, you will get different sets of results, especially during um, you know, moments where we have you know, tensions between different, uh, different words at play. And the reason why this is important is that if you are searching for something with one political valence, you may want certain kinds of results that if you're searching for it with another political valence. So what ends up happening in these environments is that depending on what you search, you end up with fragmented universes. And the example that I put up here was um, during the conversation around um, Vatican sexual abuse. Uh, the news stories in the US that were covering Vatican pedophiles versus Vatican sexual abuse were literally on opposite political spectra. And so depending on which terms you search for, you end up with fundamentally different results, especially on YouTube where there's a lot of videos that had different ideological bend, uh, bends to them. So what I struggle with as we start to deal with this is also the way in which the fifth kind comes up, which is the problematic search queries. So this is what happens when people start to search for something where people aren't producing good or high quality content with. So one of the most common and famous ones in, um, that we often talk about is did the Holocaust exist? 
the, the Holocaust happen? And the first question is, why is someone searching for this, right? What has gotten them to a point where this is a reasonable search query? And the reason, of course, is that they're hearing it in different environments. It's staged for them. So much so that like, we're seeing things like this um, at protests. We're seeing things like this um, on, I, I actually captured one from last week on the New York City subways. But most importantly in the US, we hear it on talk radio. If you don't believe me, Google, and then a phrase. And that phrase lends you to a particular place. And those are usually phrased with very problematic uh, queries, right? Who is going to produce content to counter Jews control America that has the right optimized uh, uh, search engine information to really counter that kind of thing? Um, and that's where we see these uh, moments um, coming back up. And most of this really does have a huge anti-Semitic component to it. So we're seeing the anti-Semitic logics, uh, both in Europe and the US, come back in a particular way. Um, let's see here. So I want to give you a concept, a frame for thinking about this, because this can get really dark, and we've seen a lot of really dark stuff in this process. I want to give you a concept called agnotology. And I love this word, because it is the study of ignorance. Um, and it's particularly interesting in the idea that ignorance is not a matter of not yet knowing. It's a matter of something that is actively seeded so that you will want to undo the kinds of information you once had. Um, and we keep coming back to this idea that if we have more data, we can have more knowledge. But actually what we're seeing is the ways in which data are used to pervert our broader understanding. Right? The idea that instead of data giving us a sense of cumulative knowledge, that there is a moment where, because we have so much information, we can see data out and we can undermine confidence in the information that we have. Right? And this, of course, combines with a notion of epistemology, epistemology being the idea of how we know what we know. The idea that we should be able to produce knowledge in a, in a sensible way, um, but that production of knowledge is, of course, a process, and it is actually different depending on which environment you're in. And this is where I'm going to give you a quote after uh, that Cory Doctorow put up, because I think it's a beautiful moment about where he, um, as a Canadian, was trying to make sense of what was going on in the U.S. around how people were talking past one another. And this was at a time when um, the uh, political establishment was talking about alternative alternative facts. So he says, we're not disagreeing about facts, we're disagreeing about epistemology. The establishment version of epistemology is, we use evidence to arrive at the truth, vetted by independent verification, but trust us when we tell you that it's all been independently verified by people who are properly skeptical and not the bosom buddies of the people they were supposed to be fact checking. The alternative facts epistemological method goes like this. The so-called independent experts who were supposed to be verifying the so-called evidence-based truth were actually in bed with the people they were supposed to be fact-checking. In the end, it's all a matter of faith then. Either you have faith in their experts being truthful or you have the faith that we are. Ask your gut what feels more truthful. This is a way of undoing knowledge, a way of challenging things based on saying this is about experience, not about anything that you might be able to build up as evidence. This is not about using data to come at the truth. This is about the idea that you distrust the whole system, so therefore question it, and if you question it, you won't want to side with anything that they're telling you. Now, we've seen this before. Um, I'm particularly enamored by the uh, Russia Today campaign that had a very sophisticated way of going about this. Um, they built a set of ads, um, like the one that you're seeing uh, on the left, um, and the, you know, the big letters are, is climate change more science fiction than science fact? But what's interesting is the tiny, tiny print that you can't read, um, which says, just how reliable is the evidence that suggests human activity impacts on climate change? The answer isn't always clear cut. It's only possible to make a balanced judgment if you are better informed. By challenging the accepted view, we reveal a side of the news that you wouldn't normally see, because we believe that the more you question, the more you know. This sounds like really good media literacy, only it's not. It's staged to make certain that you go and self-investigate something, that you come up with and you create a false equivalency between two different ideas around climate science, so that you start to doubt 
the data that is produced on climate change. And more importantly, you start to recognize RT as the, as the organization that will give you both sides. Now, this campaign was uh, plastered all over London. And what happened uh, when it was plastered all over London is people were outraged, right? They recognized what kinds of games this was playing. And so they were removed. And what you're seeing in the background um, of the news anchor is um, a, a poster that was put up. It says, this is what happens when your content is redacted, right? The idea that they couldn't even put up this because what does it mean we should be able to allow for free speech, right? And that should be familiar in considering our current conversation of social media. Shouldn't they be allowed to just allow free speech in any form? Now, strategically placed ignorance um, is plaguing many different contexts, um, and they occur in all different phenomena. It's not just a matter of climate, it's not just a matter of politics, but I'll talk about it in terms of public health. Um, so in the United States um, and in different parts of Europe, we're seeing a measles outbreak, um, which is horrifying to a lot of public health experts. So how did we get there? Why are we seeing this kind of dynamic? Um, part of it is, is that the active coordination of trying to undermine um, research on vaccination uh, has become part and parlance with uh, questions about whether or not you trust any form of establishment knowledge, right? Can you really trust what a doctor is telling you? Can you really trust what the news is telling you. So much so that the more that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, says that there is no correlation between autism and vaccination, the more that we see search queries related to this, the more that we see people adopting a view that there actually is a conspiracy there around um, uh, vaccination. So. What happened, of course, is that the companies have started struggling with this. What should they do with anti-vaxxing content? Should they make it go away? And that's where things have gotten really interesting, because on one hand, people are saying, yes, this content is toxic. It is problematic. And so YouTube went and got rid of some of the most egregious content. Now, it's important to give a little bit of the backstory here, which is that at, before um, YouTube got rid of the content, they had tried really desperately to upweight content from legitimate sources. So indeed, before all of this, if you would go to YouTube and you would search for information related to vaccine and autism or related to whether or not the measles vaccine was a good idea, et cetera, you would get the Center for Disease Control's videos. Let me tell you, those boring videos were boring. Right? Nobody really wanted to watch those videos. But more importantly, what you got next was a set of recommendations. And what you saw was the same kind of media manipulation and coordination that we mentioned earlier with regard to search engine optimization, only optimized for the recommendation engines. So you saw people coordinate and successfully make certain that the next video that was watched would lead them to not a video that denied um, vaccination, but a video that questioned it. How do you know is this safe? Why should your child be the one who is experimented upon, et cetera? And that became a huge challenge because how do you start getting rid of videos by parents that are asking questions? They're not actually staging and saying, don't get vaccinated. They're, they're saying, go investigate more. And that's where you started to see this, this sort of movement of how to start shifting the conversation. And it becomes really difficult. And I think about this often when I go back to early days um, of AOL, where AOL had originally um, blocked any reference to anorexia and bulimia, right? Um, disordered eating practices that were starting to become communities and culture. So what happened was that most people online started talking about their best friend Anna and their best friend Mia. And we saw the rise of what is now pro-Anna and pro-Mia culture because the name Anna is too common to block. And so this is what we're seeing already happening with the anti-vaccine conversation. We're seeing an evolution of it where it's rather than seeing the, the really explicit content, we're seeing it morph into these environments where it's just there. It's just shaping the conversation just by asking questions. And that's where I often struggle with a lot of the conversations about how to deal with fake news or other various conversations about inaccurate information. Because these all seem reasonable, right? Consider the source, read beyond it, check the date, is it a joke, check the author, so what are the supporting sources, check your biases, ask the experts. This sounds great. Except it all assumes that you start from a place where you trust different kinds of information sources, where you have networks that will actually give you the information you want. 
But what we see over and over again is that people's experiences contradict with these frames all the time. And depending on the networks that people operate in, the way that they understand what is a legitimate source really influences this process. Right? Do you trust the medical establishment? There's all sorts of great documentation that give you long histories of medical abuse. We talk about the Nazi experiments. We talk about Tuskegee. So why should you trust a doctor? Right? But if that's your starting point, these processes lead you down deep and weird paths. The easiest place to actually do this is to actually think about it within a, a religious context, right? How, you, know, you asked this question about media literacy, how would you spot fake news? Can you imagine walking into a room of Christian individuals and asking them um, whether or not Jesus exists? Right? If you want to fact check Jesus, we're in a deep, deep problem. Right? Because that is not the way to work through a conversation about religion. That is not how we even have it. In fact, that even concept is offensive. But what does it mean to deal with belief? How do we conceptualize and understand belief in this, in this environment? So my colleague, Francesca Tripodi, um, really wanted to understand the ideas of faith and conservatism um, in order to understand how this was playing out with people who primarily consumed um, conservative news in the United States. And what she found when she was working with evangelical communities in the US is that the way they produce knowledge using the technologies is fundamentally different than how we might see it. So she was sitting in a, a Bible study um, in Virginia and uh, you know, for those who haven't been to a Bible study, there's usually a passage that is discussed. And in that passage, there's a deep conversation about what this means and how to apply that passage to your life. And this way of interpreting the text, not as literal text, but through a form of scriptural inference. And then after you know, doing this process for an hour, the um, uh, pastor in this particular Bible study then turned to the US's tax reform bill. And Francesca was like, wait, what? And once again, took a passage from one of our political texts in the moment and used the same ways of interpreting as had been used in the Bible to interpret a um, tax reform bill. And at that moment, Francesca realized that the way in which people were interpreting texts in this environment was staged in different ways. And that she realized that religion was being introduced in ways that the tax reform bill folks may or may not have understood, but we can promise you Google didn't. And the same thing was actually applying to how they were searching Google. They were encouraged to find the right search query. Now, what does it mean to find the right search query? It's to make certain that the search query gives you the results that are appropriate. Until then, you haven't done the right search. And she saw people building these processes of figuring out how to do the right search query to get the right results based on a set of inferences that make sense. And you can see both how this contradicts everything that Google is designed for, but also how it creates these huge cultural collisions over what constitutes rightness. Violent extremism. So the reason I'm giving you some of these passes, I want to put, put in motion what the consequences of them are. I think you here know, um, but we are seeing them all over the place. And I want to say how they're directly connected by giving you a case in the United States um, in 2012. At the time, it was hard to avoid the names Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman um, in the US, but that didn't mean most people actually knew what was going on. And a white teenager in South Carolina felt like he didn't understand it, so he went to Wikipedia in order to understand more. And he was left with the impression that George Zimmerman was in the right, um, and he was disgusted and upset by, Mar um, by uh, Trayvon Martin. But more importantly, in Wikipedia, he encountered a phrase, black on white crime. And he threw that phrase into Google, and it brought him to some extremely extremist environments. Um, and he spent the next um, uh, two and a half years really detailing and going into these white nationalist environments. Um, so much so that on June 17th, 2015, he sat down for an hour with a group of African American churchgoers in their church in South Carolina before opening fire and killing nine of them and injuring one. And he was very explicit in his manifesto that he wanted to start a race war. We actually know his pathway to radicalization, but we don't know why he adopted those views. And seven years later, things have only gotten worse and much more extreme. So on March 15, 2019, a terrorist walked into a mosque in Christchurch and started shooting. By the time he was done, 51 people would be dead and another 49 would be injured. And I'm sure we all watched this with complete horror, 
But what was often not known about what, we, what he was doing was that this particular terrorist was actually testing a variety of systems in an extraordinary way. The first ways he tested was the news media. He produced a manifesto that was filled with all sorts of references that were perfect search queries and would create absolute mass chaos and create his story in the front page. And sure enough, journalists took the, took the bait and they posted it. They used the name of his manifesto, which sent people straight into extremist content. They used the names of all sorts of people that he was mocking in his manifesto as being serious. They responded poorly and it sort of iterated and become a media spectacle. That's one set of issues. The other set of issues is that he made a video, uh, or he live streamed from, um, uh, from Facebook. But the thing about his live stream from Facebook is that he didn't actually have very many followers on Facebook. He relied on people coming from 8chan to Facebook, because really what he wanted to do was make Facebook a part of the story. Um, he could have live streamed in all sorts of places that 8chan could have gone. What he did was interesting was he did a bunch of things to try to um, skip over the various gates that Facebook had set up. So, for example, the link from uh, 8chan wasn't live. You had to manually type it in in order to get to uh, the Facebook page. Once on Facebook, one of the things he was doing is he'd put tape all over his gun because Facebook actually has different systems to detect guns, and that's a way of passing them. Facebook has a way of doing things where they do a recheck after five minutes. He didn't begin shooting until after six minutes. These are the kinds of things he did to not trip over the system. More importantly, after he'd been arrested, after the atrocity had been known to the public, people started pummeling the different, uh, different kinds of websites with that video. There were over 300,000 unique copies of that video made and posted, millions of uploads to all of the different services by people trying to see whether or not that upload would stick. It wasn't simply about getting the content out there, it was about testing all of the systems. And that's where we see this moment of all of these relationships between the different kinds of actions of media manipulation and the violent extremism that we're starting to see. Now, I don't believe that the internet made terrorists. Society does. We create the conditions, we enable the grievances through our policies and cultural logics, and the media manipulators know how to exploit that, how to take what is already part of our social logics and make certain to push it and move it across these environments. They know how to exploit vulnerabilities in our socio-technical systems. They know how to take somebody who has a grievance and channel them to a logic that actually is extremist. They know how to take questions and use it to undo knowledge. And it's because of that media manipulation that I am deeply worried. But here's the thing. We can't fix this mess simply by improving the data or fact-checking our way through this. We can't fix it by regulating social media, although I don't mind that as a, a band-aid. We need to recognize that in order to deal with this, we're going to have to move beyond just seeing this as a technical issue and recognize the social-technical relationships between that. Yes, what was built fundamentally broke things, right? They were moved fast and they broke things. But repairing it isn't just about putting together the technology. It's about putting together the society that got broken along the way. So as I conclude, I want to give you a couple of very thing specific things you can do. The first thing I want to prioritize is the need to hold people. I referenced at the beginning that I was a queer kid growing up online, and that was a very important and special thing for me. Because when I grew up online and I was able to ask ridiculous questions, there were people, other queer folks out there telling me it would be okay, helping me through and struggles. One of the things I've noticed in talking to young people over the last 20 years is that culture of reaching out to people on the internet and just holding them, making sure that they're okay, it's gone. We go online to spend time with the people we know, the people who sp speak like us, who talk like us, who think like us. We're in a moment where we're talking about cancel culture, when we're talking about the idea that we're going to challenge people, and we yell and scream that somebody's not woke enough, rather than actually taking a moment to figure out how to hold a young person through this. And what scares me right now is that I am on the board of an organization called Crisis Text Line. So we watch kids in deep pain regularly reaching out for help and not getting any support that they have, not having adults who are really there reaching out to hold them. And they're desperate, and we unfortunately see a lot of suicide um, attempts from this. And I struggle with this because what would it mean if we all got back to those early days of the internet, those 1994 days where we were actually holding people and making sure that they're okay? Because if we collectively did
did that at scale, so much more would happen. Because right now I can tell you who's holding people online. This is where we're seeing extremists move. This is what's powerful about the small group of white nationalists out there. They are spending a lot of time holding people and they are building numbers through that way, through a th small group of people going, growing slowly. And I think that's really important to understand because that is something that we can all do. Turn to YouTube, find people who are struggling, and be there for them. The second thing we need to do is that we've built all these tools that allow us to see our social networks, but we're not being smart about how our social networks were, are built. There are all sorts of ways in which you can strategically re-knit a network, but what we're seeing right now is people are learning how to cut a network. They're learning how to polarize. They're making certain that the bridging connections between people with different values and ideas aren't actually enabled. And there are all sorts of different ways that this can be done. This can be done by community service. This can be done by uh, different kinds of coming together as a society, um, but it really is important that you think about the social graph of your entire culture, of our countries, of our communities, and think about how we bridge that. Be smart about bu building those networks through any means possible, because those networks need to be re-knit if we stand any chance of combating a lot of the different things that are happening. The world feels pretty upside down right now for many people. And a lot of people are looking at the internet and saying that the internet made it this way. And I'm a big believer that the internet mirrors and magnifies the good, bad, and ugly. And we spend a lot of time fetishizing the good and being excited by the good, but we're also now sort of flipping and going, oh, the bad and ugly is bad and ugly. And it is. And I want us to hold those dichotomous ideas in mind and realize that what we're seeing is part of the broader and more complex parts of our society. So if we want to actually address this, the way to move forward is to see it for all that it is, see the networks that are possible, the ability to flow information through networks as being an opportunity and a site for exploitation, and find a way to hold one another. Thank you. Um. Thank you so much, Dana. What a great talk. Um, we will not have a longer time for discussion right now, but we will take the opportunity to ask you one question. So, since you have been dubbed the high priestess of internet friendship by Financial Times, and I think of hearing when you're saying holding people online, what a lovely term, by the way. It's like a virtual hug. Um, what does this mean to you, to be the high priestess of internet friendship? And, and yeah, how does it feel to have that title? It feels like somebody had a good marketing time. Um, <laughs> I mean, part of it was that I've always been interested in the networks that we exist in. Um, and I came to the early days of social media trying to understand the networks and the graphs. Um, in fact, one of the first projects I did was looking at uh, Usenet. Um, for those who don't remember, this is like bulletin boards of like old days. Um, but part of what I was trying to understand is how did information flow across it and what were the networks? I realized really early on that the internet was made of networks. Networks of people, networks of ideas. And this is before we understand how to operationalize this in search engines or that before we talked about you know, Friendster and Facebook and all of these things. And so when I was labeled, this was the height of Friendster, actually. Um, so it was really the height of the networks. And in some ways, I took it you know, in a positive sense, which is that, yes, you call it friendship, I call it networks. Let's make certain we understand it. And I think there was a moment um, you know, that was sort of mocked during the Friendster days, and again during the Facebook days, where it's like, why is everybody just virtual friends? And I was like, actually, that's kind of what society is. Society is about all of us saying, I see you. I acknowledge you. Yeah, you might not be the person that I'm going to tell my deepest and darkest secrets to. I know. But, but the point is, is that we can build that relationship. And it's that exchange that builds that relationship. And how do we actually recognize and see one another on a regular basis? And that, to me, is the beginning of the idea of holding people.